Well, how to find a shed antler. It's that time of year, folks. And we always tried two, two or three videos um, about finding a shed antler. And before I begin, there's something going on very bad on YouTube right now on our channel. I didn't even tell Dylan I was going to talk about this, but no, we're not giving a free bow giveaway. I've been getting messages about this. Yeah, we had a, we had a, um, a guy, a kid, write us a hand, handwritten letter. I wish I could remember his name. This I had guy? the letter. This guy? Right here? No, not the one from Michigan. Okay, okay. Yeah, it was a different one, unless that one's the most recent one. I but um, but yeah, we had someone uh, from Wisconsin write us and said that he won five. And obviously he didn't follow through with it. And But we're finding we've had some people that have fallen for that. Whoever does this scam, they use my brand logo. They get you to give them a cell phone number, which all these are red flags. Um, you can even click on their their handle name and see that they've just started this i've been around you know my youtube channel since 2014 so we put out all our videos you know over a thousand so when you click on that and see that it's not me and that i that it's someone that uh they're not copying the actual pieces of me that uh show how long i've been around all that kind of thing that's a big red flag when they ask for your cell phone number big red flag when they say anybody in the world that says you've won something but then they want you to send them money, especially a lot. They're saying, well, we need $150 to send you a bow. You know, even, even next day air on that bow would probably be 25, 30 bucks or, you know, uh, one to two day shipping, something like that. So there's a lot of red flags, but a few people have fallen for it. I even had someone on Instagram in an open comment say, you need to stop taking money from people and, and uh, give me my money back for the bow. And I responded to him, just said, you know, you can't fall for this kind of thing. And he apologized after, but um, we're obviously not giving a bow giveaway. If we were, we wouldn't charge you for shipping. Um, and anything we do that's more of a contest related thing is we have a raffle license and we actually have people pay $100 for a hunt raffle times 100 people. And we give every dime of that, and there's no expenses, we give every dime of that to Camp Kicking Bear. Even our charity event that we have here at the house, we have paid out of pocket for porta potties for any type of food that's been given there, coffee, we pay for all of that. So we've had to pay a couple thousand dollars for that charity event that we give money on top of, uh, giving a bowl away at that event and raffling it off. So we, I don't wanna say we're in the hole, we're helping Camp Kicking Bear. We actually have people stepping up the plate this year that have wanted to be a part of that. Well, bottom line is we're not taking money from anybody in any way. Please don't fall for that stuff. I've reported them, I would literally say hundreds of times. And they just keep, up, keep coming up with new handles, new IP addresses. And it must be because they're getting a certain percentage of you guys because hunters are a loyal, honest group. And they're preying on that. Um, you're, you're not the normal, uh, cynical type person out there. And that says something about the hunting industry. That's a good thing, but it's bad they're taking advantage of you. And that certainly is not us. So let's go back to the video here. First off, find shed antler. Habitat. What's the best habitat? You know, I, I go to, it's interesting, I go to clients, uh, meet hunters all over the place. Yeah, I'm still looking for my first shed. Um, I have a good hunting buddy, actually one of Dylan's long time um, uh, uh, friends from, how long have you known Unger? Oh boy. Uh, back to when you were... Back since high school, yeah. 15, yeah. 16 years old. Yep. Yeah, so um, Unger, Ryan Unger's been around for a long time, but he last year, he found a shed when he first went out, and then we let him shed hunt on our property, and he found a shed that day. So obviously we'll let him keep it. But in between, uh, Dylan, did he walk 100 miles? I mean, it was a ridiculous, oh, ridiculous number. Miles, yeah, yeah and, he, and he didn't find one. And this is, you know, Ryan likes shed hunt. It's not like he just said, I'm gonna go shed hunt this year. And, but the point is, is that they're hard to find sometimes, but if you have the right habitat, and right habitat means winter habitat. That means uh, nearby winter food sources and high stem count. Now this could be a clear cut on public land, somewhere where the deer are congregating, and then certainly when you get in northern regions next to conifer and deer yards. And so what's interesting about that, like the UP of Michigan, we had on our property, the last deer was December 12th one year that went through the property yard, on the way to the yarding areas while they're migrating. And then we had deer all the way to the end of February, another time where the last deer track that we saw was the end of February. So huge variance. All those deer are dropping typically up there because of the lack of high quality food that produces energy, that affects testosterone levels and the amount of cold and snow they have. And people say, well, 
It doesn't have anything to do with food, but when you look at, uh, it has to do with energy reserves and how much, how healthy that deer is, a lot to do with it. Because when they had deer in the Camp Kuzno Deer Research Facility up there, those deer, because they were supplementally fed, same deer as the outside, same weather as the outside, it was a mile enclosure with a fence. They actually didn't have the cover even on the inside because it had, had been browsed out. But what they did have was food. So with that food, they would drop their antlers in February sometime up to March, sometime in March. The deer on the outside drop it typically around New Year's. So what I mean by that is you think you have winter cover that you're going to look sheds into, but if it was a mild winter, those deer might have gone there in February and already dropped their antlers six weeks earlier in their fall habitat. So you really need to look at that timing we'll talk about in a little bit, but really it boils down to high quality winter food, the best in the area, which usually isn't high quality, you know, real, real good high quality, um, and then certainly winter cover. Now what I've found is if you have really good winter food, then you'll probably have sheds even if you have uh, lower than adequate cover because deer will be drawn to that food and they'll camp out there and they spend a lot of time there and even if it's just poor cover nearby open hardwoods whatever it is they want to stick around that food source you find a lot of sheds on the flip side if you have really good cover but the best food is a mile or two away in different directions you're probably not going to see a lot of deer so we're really looking for that perfect combination of uh of really good habitat high stem count meaning Lots of hardwood regeneration, briars, weeds, grasses, shrubs. You're looking for more like that upland uh, cover and then certainly that high quality uh, habitat. So what we find when it comes to habitat, we're finding a lot of the sheds around the food source. We're finding a lot of sheds in the bedding areas that relate to that food source, especially if they're not bumped out, sp spooked out, and those deer are actually holding all winter. And then we find a little bit in between of what we call crossings, whether it's a fence crossing, a ditch crossing, a road crossing, something where they have to exert themselves, run up a steep bank, they're hitting their head around, and antler falls off. So we find a lot, I found a lot like at the bottom of a ravine where they have to go hard down across and back up. I found one the one year where it was actually frozen in on a client property where it was right in a stream where they crossed, and then there was ice, and it was really cold during February, and that shed was laying right there frozen. We couldn't even grab it because it was uh, all encased in ice. So really look at those crossings in between. Um, it's hard because you see these deer trails going through the woods that are just extreme and used uh, over and over again. Don't often find a lot of sheds until they cross somewhere. I mean, just recently in Michigan, found a little shed and it was right at a uh, fence row crossing. And I think Dylan will be showing you that because I did take uh, some video of that to give to Dylan. It just some of these, it depends on if I remember to give it to Dylan. Not, not doesn't take Dylan remembering to use it. I need to give it to him. I found a really nice shed in Northern Ohio on a client property that had six points on a side. And that again, relies on me sending it to Dylan. So we'll hopefully get that done. So really look, check out Habitat first. It'll make a giant difference. That's why some people never find a shed. They just don't have that winter habitat we have in wisconsin we have uh when the neighbor has corn and it's near our property we find more sheds we find antlers in general we don't find a lot but it's because of that winter food source moving closer to the border and that puts a lot more deer on the property all winter long like they have been this winter sometimes these sheds stick out way more than you could imagine the one big one i found in ohio was close to 100 yards away when i saw it it was a big white piece sticking out in the woods so sometimes you're you're looking so close, 10, 15, 20 feet, 50 feet away, that you ignore something that's way off in the distance white, and that's why it's great to carry uh, some monoculars around. So really paying attention to, you know, sometimes it's very obvious that they stick out. There was a report done uh, recently by the NDA, and they talked about that um, on some enclosures, some sheds weren't found at a rate of 60%, 50%, you know, high numbers of sheds weren't found. I would guess that a lot of them had to do with these tree rats that we'll talk about in a little bit. They get eaten very fast. I, I, I'm sure they could get eaten in a week or two. So depending on when someone's shed hunting, even if you have been a fenced enclosure, that doesn't mean you're gonna find all them because they can be eaten right away. There's all kinds of little critters that eat those sheds and they eat them up fast. So that's one aspect, but really sheds aren't that hard to find, especially if you know they're right in this area, you're probably going to find them. You just need to look, make sure you look behind every log. That's a big thing. You look across the landscape, you can see 95% of the ground, but you can't see behind these two logs. You need to go look there because it could be that that deer stepped over the log and they fell off just from stepping over and moving its head around too. But Sometimes sheds are very obvious to see, and I think that you can cover a lot more ground if you're taking it that way. And then really go back through and look at some of those hidden areas, like behind logs, areas like that. 
um, and always carry those binoculars too because that can help you erase it. So then you're actually looking at ground efficiently because they do stick out sometimes a lot more than you think. Crossings went over that. You know, bedding area is a great spot. Feeding area is a great spot. They spend a lot of time at both, especially those good food sources where they're spending all night around there. So we found uh, it was 23, 24 sheds two years ago, and about half of those were around our main food source here by the house. And they were either right in the food plot, right in the corn, because they spent a lot of time there or it was within 100 yards or right off to the edge where they're bedding all night. So a lot of times they're coming to a food source like that at night and they're bedding nearby and they're going back and forth a short distance and so you end up finding a lot of antlers and then you go back into the woods in an interior bedding area and you'll find a lot of sheds within that bedding area and that's historical. That'll take place every year as long as the food's there, the cover stays consistent along with the quality of food. And then also those crossings, like around here where they're crossing a ravine. Sam and I were, uh, my son Sam were driving a couple years ago on the side-by-side -side and we're looking down and we saw a shed, it was probably 100 yards away down in the ravine on the rocks. And I'm sure that buck had just crossed, gone up the other side and it knocked it off when he was going down through. So again, some of them stick out. Uh, we could have been looking near us in the side-by-side -side thinking you had to scour 20, 30, 40 feet on either side and really you need to be looking out as far as you can see because those bigger white ones really stick out even small uh, white ones tree rat problem and this kind of goes into the timing issue again but really if you're not finding that shed within two weeks three weeks with warm weather and squirrels going all over the place you might be really disappointed when you find a half chewed antler that just came just dropped uh, a week ago or two weeks ago so you really have to time it we're fortunate we uh you know we uh, formed a, a partnership with Reveal Tacticam. So we're using the Tacticam for filming purposes on our weapons in the fall. That was a big thing of that. And then the Reveal cameras. And uh, we'll have a video coming out about that pretty soon too, why I switch. There's a bunch of reason, including um, that's part of our friend group, uh, really close friends of ours, the owners of uh, Reveal, at least one of the main owners and originators of Reveal Tacticam. So uh, that's a big part of it too. But bottom line is, um, we get to watch a lot of these bucks all winter along with our cell cameras and uh, we're able to collect a lot of HD footage uh, videos now through cell cam which we didn't do before and so um, we're watching these bucks and I can honestly tell you uh, Dylan date today 13th February 13th um, so over the last two weeks we've gone from 80% holding to probably 10, 20% holding at most. There's one buck, he's a three-year-old, we call him Junior. He's still holding as of yesterday morning on the 12th. So we're waiting for Junior to drop. Bottom line, no matter what though, I have my friend Mike coming in from uh, out of state. We're coming, he's coming out to do some ice fishing on Wednesday and stay here for a few days. And so Mike and Jen and I will really be looking for some sheds. Might get Dante around too. Um, that'll be our big shed hunting trip. So I'm hoping Junior falls in the next three days, somewhere around there, we'll, we'll see. But um, we're really, you know, I'm kind of worried because that we have old snow, which was great for searching for sheds, keeps getting lower. But now that we've had some warmer temperatures, we're seeing in the cell cams, uh, raccoons and, uh, and then those tree rats, those squirrels, they're all over the place. And they'll find those sheds pretty quick. So I'm sure some have already been chewed on quite a bit, even the ones that fell in the last 10 days. And we need to get out there. But that's a big problem. They can disappear quickly. You think, well, I didn't find any of the sheds here. There weren't any bucks here. And it was just because of those those squirrels uh, ch chomping at them. And I would imagine porcupine and other critters uh, um, would uh, chomp on them, uh, possum maybe. So there's a lot of, po a lot of uh, little critters that could chew on these, but especially uh, squirrels. You know, finally, kind of goes back to habitat. If you don't have good habitat, either food or cover, but especially food, then cover, then you're not going to have deer. And so really you need to assess, are you seeing big clusters of pellets down bedding areas that are on top of the leaves where you can say, yeah, there are a lot of deer and their dark pellets are not brown. They're not brown from October, November. They're actually black because it's recently January pellets uh, that, that dropped or February in clusters, lots of clusters. And where you find big and small clusters, that's does and fawns, pretty easy to see. When you big, a big solid clusters, solitary deer that are bedding in an area of no fawns, you might have found a buck hot spot. And so really you need to have deer in these, in these areas. And that can be a timing issue. Like going back to, we talked about in the UP of uh, Michigan where these deer are dropping around New Year's and they might drop into the 15th of January at the latest. If they have good food in that same spot, same deer, they're gonna drop in mid-February to March. But 
there's not many areas up there out in the woods that deer all of a sudden have a cornfield and standing brassica and beans to eat on all winter and, and live high in the hog. It's usually feast or famine in those areas and mostly famine when it comes to good quality food that would give those deer the condition going through the fall and into the winter that they actually drop their antlers appreciably later like they did in the enclosure when they're supplementally fed. That'll make a big difference. Usually we're comparing apples to apples, meaning that these deer shred, shed around the same time in your area and there's not much that's going to change that because most people aren't putting a fence around an acre, a mile section and then um, and then supplementing feeding deer. That's, that's a completely different story. And so you really need to look at when are those deer dropping in your areas and I'll just give you some general guidelines up north wilderness settings and this could apply to even big forests in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. So it's not necessarily up north, but if you have colder winters typically and then you don't have great food, you have big open hardwoods, uh, not a lot of high quality browse, clear cuts, things like that, then you're going to have antlers dropping earlier. And so you can kind of look at those areas. And, and so I, like when I go to my Michigan trip in February, if I'm up north, like out of big rapids and then I go up north from there, that's when, if someone has some really good food sources around, I might find some antlers. But I was in southern Michigan, uh, in the Thumb area in southern Michigan for this last trip in northern Ohio. And in that case, I'm not going to find a lot of antlers, although I did find one in Michigan, one in Ohio. But it's because I'm not up north where there's more harsh conditions. And so you look at those conditions for your area. Around here, we're in mixed ag. But we have cold winters. Um, here in Minnesota, it's even colder than where I was in Wisconsin, certainly a lot colder than even in the UP of Michigan, for example. So that cold bears into it as far as the overall condition and energy reserves in that deer. And, uh, and so around here, we're more moderate. You know, like I said in the last week, which would be the first week of February, 10 days, two weeks right around there, then we're finding a lot drop right now. We don't have many. We still have some holding in March, but not very often at all. And then when you get over into Wisconsin over there, if you have big neighborly food sources, we've had actually a three-year-old holding in early April before. So it can vary quite a bit in some of those areas. And in those areas, I'm sure there's some that have already dropped. We've seen them. But as of yesterday, I still, on one of my reveals, they had uh, had the four-year-old uh, four eight-point that I passed up during bow season, he's still holding. So it's that was one thing to see him make it through the season. That was great, but he's still holding. And I haven't seen the big eight point I've been after. He's nine point. Uh, that was a six year old. I haven't seen his antlers on for a while now. It's been probably two weeks since I've seen him. So I would suspect he's already dropped and we're waiting for this one. And uh, hopefully we'll actually find him on the property because we've been seeing him a little bit over there. Um, so we want to push that timing past. You know, one hand you can go too late where two months later and a bunch of squirrels, you're probably not gonna find much. And whereas if you go too early, you're bumping deer off and then you're not gonna find much. Public land can be a different story. You can kind of throw a lot of this timing and everything out the window, especially habitat, because hunters are out shed hunting hard. And they're, they're looking really hard on public land. Uh, we know people that put on um, a few dozen miles every single year looking for sheds. And those people are stirring deer around. They're pushing them. But at the same time, they're finding them right when they drop. They're finding them pretty soon. And so shed hunting is a little bit different on public land. You really have to beat people to it. And I find that's more, instead of timing, you're waiting like we are for this perfect timing this week. We're going to go in. We expect to find some antlers. A lot different than on public land where you want consistency over a long period of time trying to scour up anything that you can find out there, knowing that people are also doing the same and that means they're pushing deer around the same too. So unless you find really hidden pockets of winter yarding area and browse, you're not gonna stumble onto this pile of sheds on public land typically like you would on private land where you have good, uh, good food, good habitat, good cover that's been specifically worked on uh, by the landowners that uh, have those small parcels. So. A lot more sheds per acre on private land um, than sheds per acre on public land, even given the same amount of deer. So I hope you can find a shed this year. Um, again, like Unger last year, he found those two, a lot of miles in between. A lot of that has to do with the habitat you're on and, and looking on. But, um, but bottom line is you follow some of these basic guidelines right there, you'll be a better, sh better shed hunter this season and beyond. 
Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to this is a bedding area stand, this is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.